generous giving and your love. I always love to read a testimony. I sound like I'm hollow. What's going on with me? All right, fix that real quick, Timothy. All right, let's go, let's go. Here's a Lisa, and she writes, Dear Pastor Paula, my daughter was experienced, thank you, Pastor Todd, panic attacks, anxiety, depression, and was on medication. It got to the point that she was struggling with major insomnia. Am I still sounding hollow? Do I sound normal out there? I sound good to you? Praise the Lord. I sound beautiful? All right. Let's fix these ears here, right? After fasting and praying and trusting in the Lord and the Holy Spirit, said, now is the time to be released. And so I contacted the prayer team, submitted my request. We received a miracle. Come on, if it was your daughter, you'd be excited. A pure breakthrough. My daughter is completely delivered. When she went to her counselor, the counselor saw an immediate difference. Delivered, I like that. She was immediately delivered. She was immediately delivered. I like that. She was immediately delivered. She was immediately delivered. It says, when she went to the counselor, they saw an immediate difference and actually cried for her because of her breakthrough. Thank you, Pastor Paul, all the prayer members who participate as prayer warriors. I'm so grateful. And that is from Lisa. You know, I really love this. I believe that maybe um, tonight God's gonna bring some deliverance to us. I believe that. And I was, I was talking to Minister John and we were talking through a situation. And I said, you know, babe, I said, it's it, more problems are spiritual than they are natural. If you're dealing with the natural, I mean, usually a natural thing solves it, right? But, but spiritually, you can't solve a spiritual problem with a natural solution. So when you're dealing with a demon, you can't reason it. You, you can't logic it. You can't buy it. You can't stop it. It's like, it's not natural. So God gives us these tools though. He gives us some, some wonderful tools. We've been studying some of those, right? Prayer, fasting, and giving. His word, the greatest tool, his son, Jesus Christ. That sounds wrong tool, but the greatest enforcement of the power of God and the position we have in him is through his son, Jesus Christ, which makes all the tools effective. So if you know, fasting, we, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk about giving tonight. We're gonna do it specifically in a very specific direction. But let's just look at when it says, when you fast, when you pray, when you give, right? It says that God will what? Reward us. And that word reward means to deliver. So last week, I'll give them to you just real quick because I like the benefits of things. Do you guys like benefits or is it just me? I like benefits. Um, Dr. Paul, I was saying today, and I don't know why that's doing that, all right? Be healed in Jesus' name. Be delivered. Um, praise God. So I, I was um, saying, do y'all hear that or is that me just hearing that? There is a sound. Okay, because I thought I'm talking about demons and like I'm starting to hear, oh, oh. I'm like, uh, no, thank you. <laughs> just So... All right, let's get back. That, that When you pray, when you fast, when you give, it brings rewards, it brings deliverance. I like God's goodness in my life. I, I'm, I told Pastor Todd, I'm kind of spoiled in the things of God. I'm, I'm used to living in excessive goodness. I'm used to living in a place that is so intimate with God. I see his hand in everything. I love his excessive goodness. I'm not talking ordinary stuff. Extremely extraordinary, excessive goodness of God. Unprecedented favor. His blessing upon blessing. Things that they say are impossible being possible. And I personally think that's how we should all live. So when, when there is something that isn't flowing like that, because there's a flow to God's goodness, it's usually either God course correcting me, something either not, not in order, not, not right in my life. Now, don't get me wrong. I've gone through extreme brokenness, but had extreme peace in it. I've had the joy of the Lord. Oh, I've cried. I've lost down to 94 pounds where I didn't feel like eating, but I knew he was with me. It's not like you don't have hard days or battle days. You're going to face a lot of battles. You don't have to fight the battle. God has your battle. I get concerned when I'm at AI 
and we start getting defeated. I get concerned because God shows and tells us that they will know your mind basically because I'll defeat your enemies. Now your enemies are not church people, guys. It's probably your own issues in your soul. It's our own sick soul. We have a real enemy. His name is Satan, also known as Lucifer, the devil. He's got an army that's been around creating habit in our life for a long time. We know the power of prayer. It brings the will of God to the earth. We learned that, that fasting, one of the first things it does is it breaks the bonds of wickedness. And we stayed an entire sermon last week on wickedness. Ooh. But fasting also solves problems. It breaks poverty because poverty is the spirit. You, you can have, they'll say, what is it, 96% of people who win the lotto are broke within just, what, a few years? How do you get millions of dollars and you're broke? It's a spirit. If you, God said, look, write it all in the book of Haggai. You, you're going to have money. You're going to have houses, but you're going to have holes in your pocket. It's a spirit. So you have to deal with things not from a natural realm, but from a spiritual realm. So we understand fasting is powerful. It breaks poverty. It solves problems. I, one of the most important reasons to fast, remember when John's disciples said, hey, why don't Jesus' disciples have to fast? He said, well, when the bridegroom's with you. He said, but when the bridegroom is taken, when you start feeling um, distant from God, fasting brings his presence. Fasting brings you close. The presence of God is one of the most important reasons. Matthew chapter 9, verse 14 and 15. You fast for the presence of God. So when I say we pray, we fast, we give, we'll get into some of those other rewards there. But, you know, when I say I live in the excessive goodness of God, I, I have God burdens. But one thing I refuse to carry is a demonic burden. So there's certain things that God gives to us because when, when something's off, we have to examine our life. We're constantly told, examine, you know, put yourself up under the submission of the Holy Spirit. Crucify yourself every day. Be not conformed to this word. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, perfect will of the Ro Lord. Romans chapter 12. So fasting, giving, and praying is not a January thing. It's an everyday thing. It's a constant, this is just the first month of our Western calendar where we reset and, and set down pathways and patterns to help us stay the course. Amen? So can I give you some of these rewards and we're going to stay the course in a few other areas and look at some things that might help us examine ourselves. So fasting brings revelation, it brings sight. Acts 9, 9 through 18. Fasting brings power. Did you know fasting helps you discern and find a spouse. Isaac wasn't married, remember? Eliezer goes on a fast and brings Rebecca back. Fasting helps you know the will of God. We fast to ordain leadership and to put elders in place. Fasting releases ministry gifting. Fasting brings household salvation. Fasting breaks the spirit of grief. Just a few. So now, I'll come back. I've got a whole book on that. You guys can read the book on the power of fasting. Tomorrow, a book comes out I'm excited about, Money Matters. I'm excited about that one. We, I'm writing some back-to-back -back books, guys. So let's talk the power of giving, which ironically really has nothing to do with giving, but it has everything to do with giving. So let's talk. Five frogs are sitting on a log. Four decide to jump off. Do you know it? Four decide to jump off. How many are sitting on the log? One? Five? One? Five frogs are still on the log because deciding is not doing. You can decide all day long that you're going to do something, but until you do, Five frogs are sitting on the logs. Four do jump off. Now you've got one frog left. 
Because deciding, you can decide, you wrote down your goals, you can decide, I'm gonna have a God year like never before. I'm gonna be closer to God. My children are gonna get saved. I'm gonna believe God. I'm gonna use my spiritual tools, right? But faith without works is dead. Now this is not works based, but this is understanding that our weapons of warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. So let's talk about some different things. First off, the, the Bible gives a myriad of offerings. Do you want to know my top three offerings? Because it's really all under stewardship. First fruits, tithe and alms. To me, they're the most important. Now there's peace offerings, there's Thanksgiving offering, there's first, there's, there's offerings at all the feast seasons and I always partake in feast divine appointments. I don't stand before the Lord empty handed, but those are things that I practice daily. Sometime I'll teach you the five offerings of the Old Testament, won't that? Or like, yeah, all right. So first fruits, first fruits is the whole, anytime there's increase. That's an offering, but first fruits is a principle. I'm gonna teach you this because I think it's a key that's gonna unlock some things for you. Now, it's not an all giving. This is not about, okay, bring a big first fruits. Actual first fruits offering is during a first, one of the feast seasons. In January, our calendar's the first. All first belong to God. They belong to God anytime there is an ending of one thing and a beginning of another thing, that first belongs to God. Anytime there's increase in your life, that first belongs to God. God lays claim to all first. It's the ir irrevocable giving over to the Lord things that belong to him and him alone. There's the principle of it. Are we So remember, first fruits principle is what I teach a lot. There's a first fruit offering, which I'll touch on tonight. There's first fruit. Jesus is the first fruit of many brethren. There's a first fruit feast, right? There's many different first fruit. So here's some of the blessings of the first fruit. Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 30. When you bring the first fruit, which was for the priesthood, for the house of God, the Bible says that the man, the woman of God, waves that before the Lord in Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 30, and pronounces Barak, declares the blessing of the Lord over your house. So it says that the blessing of God would rest on your house. Now, it doesn't mean your home like your abode. It means your generations. So the promise to come, the bekor, when, when it is brought into the house of God to the man, the woman of God, which is the whole of the increase, anytime there's increase in your life, there's to be a pronounced blessing on your generations. I get excited about that because I think I'm gonna be in that Hebrews chapter 12 crowd going down. Dr. Paul, we're gonna be up there to the next generations until the Lord comes back. I'm gonna be saying, you guys go. In Brad's last name, of course, is Knight. I'm gonna say, Knight, y'all got this. Come on, keep running this race. He's gonna be going, go Zals, go. We're gonna produce lineage and legacies. My goal before the Lord and I'm working on it right now, is 10 generations of preachers. We teach this to Asher, we teach this to Nick, that whatever they do, they've got to preach the gospel. If they're a doctor, they still have to preach. If they're, they're whatever, they're gonna preach. You go, really? I just believe God will honor it. I believe there's generational blessing. I, they can have whatever career, but I know they have calling. I know they have calling because of my great-grandmother. I know that my great-grandmother said, I saw your great-great-grandfather that built the church in Sacramento. You see, this blessing thing is generational. The best thing and the biggest thing you can get is not more square footage in your home, but it's God's presence on your lineage. It's his endorsement and divine favor. Come on, think of it. When I said excess blessing, if the first thing that came to your mind was bigger wills for your rent to rent to rent to own, no. If it was, if it was a bigger, fancier car, man, I'm not chiding you, but I'm saying let's get out of that carnality because big blessing is you establishing generational, spiritual impact into this world. That, that you're part of something bigger than you. You're living for something bigger than something that's just going to go into waste and 
and be judged with wood, hay, and stubble. You're living for eternal rewards. Come on, you're living for God doing big things. We're not just fasting so I don't always stay in a victim mentality of let me get my breakthrough. The goodness of the Lord is when I got to walk down the corridors of the White House, one of the highest office in the land, speak into the ear of a man that was sitting in the highest office and be a final way in on things like Israel and life and the church and religious liberty and freedoms. That's favor. Goodness is when God has planted my foot on every continent, continent just about it. And I've seen millions of millions of people come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Goodness is I get to pastor in Apopka, Florida and train up a mighty army and help Pastor Brad raise up story life. Come on. Goodness is I preach to 190 nations every single day. That's excessive kind of goodness. God's never done anything little in my life. He's always been a big, big God. He's a big God for you. You ready? Say, bring it on, Pastor Paula. So blessings. Exodus chapter 23, verse 20. There's actually a lot of them in there. It says that an angel will go before you to prepare the way, to tackle your adversaries for you. Think about that. So God says, as you honor, and, and when you put, this is really about putting the order of God in your life tonight. That's what First Roots is about. He said, an angel's going before you. Now think how cool that is, because I have no idea Mr. John, what's ahead of you in Pennsylvania, what's ahead of you in Charlottesville, but I do know an angel's going before you and whatever adversary is meant to come after you, that angel is going to tackle it before it gets to you. Whatever demonic plot is being planned and plotted, an angel, I believe that, I stand on that, I enforce that in the name of Jesus. So angels walk in front of you. You know what God says when we honor him with first root? He'll be an enemy to our enemies. I would not want to mess with one of you because he will be an enemy to our enemy. People are not your enemy. You're not wrestling against flesh and blood. You're wrestling against the demon that's possessing and, and using that person to bring wickedness. Amen? So we believe God for divine deliverance. Your bread and your drink are guaranteed. You're not going to have to take worry or thought for your everyday needs. Come on, no disease will come near you, he says. When you honor him with first fruits, he says you're going to be long life and you'll be satisfied. The disease does not get to take you out of this short. It's not going to happen in the name of Jesus. No miscarriage or infertility in your land. You're not going to have barrenness. You're going to be fruitful. You're going to produce. You're going to multiply. These are God's promises for you. I'd be getting excited about it. Fulfillment of your days of life. Long-lasted life. Fruitful life. Possession of the promised land. He goes on, you'll receive multiplication provision. John 6, 5 through 13. Deuteronomy 8, 18. You'll have power to get wealth. And I just believe that, that God is faithful to his word. So... You ready? Of all the first fruits teaching, and I've been doing this for almost 25, 30 years, the Lord began to give me revelation. God said, take them to Cain and Abel. So I'm going to take you to the very first offering and the very first first fruit. So let me lay a few things down for you first. I teach this a lot, but I want to make sure that you get it. So say, bring it on, Pastor Top Paula. Say, bring it on. Okay, the patterns of God are established by man and, and that have revelation of them, patterns. Everybody say patterns. So patterns in a nutshell, and I teach this so much, is divine accurate order and arrangement of things. When you look at patterns in the Bible, um, you know, people say, what do you believe, da, 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 da. And some things the Bible are not specific about. Like we don't know exactly when the return of the Lord is. Jesus doesn't know. Only God the Father knows, correct? Amen. But there are certain patterns and in Matthew, he tells us some of the patterns that are going to take place. Now, that doesn't mean you get to go out and say, I think it's going to be October 8th. He's like, come on, just make sure that your lamp has some, some oil in it. So don't get so hung up with being the high and mighty one that has a date. It doesn't matter. I mean, really. But there are some things, if you win or you, we talk about this, are you post-trip, pre-trip, mid-trip? Well, you go, the Bible doesn't tell us. It doesn't tell me which one, Ryan. But you know what it does show me? Certain patterns. You go, where's America? The Bible doesn't tell me where America is. Doesn't tell me. I know you all go, well, I know Iraq and Iran and I know Russia and I know, I know all you Perry Stone followers, right? Perry's a good friend of mine. 
So you're looking and going, but how do I know where America's heading? Patterns. So there are patterns in our life. You know, every one of you have a love map. Every one of you have 90% of your thoughts that are subconscious, that are driving the majority of our life out of our 60,000 thoughts a day. Now we're looking at me funny. And until that mind gets changed, those patterns are so forceful. You're like, man, I'm, I'm like the dog in the vomit. I don't wanna be here. I don't wanna keep doing this. But it's so much a pattern that was established in you until something really breaks that. So I like, the, I like deliverance. Because I was telling Minister John, I said, you, you can't counsel a demon. Like it has to be, there has to be deliverance. And everyone thinks, well, I'm saved, I don't have a devil. That is not true. You're not possessed by a devil, but you can certainly be oppressed. There are certain times I've needed, I needed Papa to put a gallon of oil on me. I've needed the, the prayer warriors in Ghana praying over me with intensity because at that moment, in that season, I didn't have the kind of strength I needed. I know people that love God and have taken their life. I know people that love God and mess up their home. Not because they're wicked, because there are times that I don't care how long you've served with God, and the enemy's good at what he does. So if you can't fast for yourself, come on, we'll fast for you. Because there are gonna be some days I need y'all fasting for me, praying for me, giving for me. I can't tell you how many times I prayed or I fasted. I wrote a check out, put all my kids' names on it all the time. I think I would put all the kids' names who all are serving God and saved now all the time, honoring God, making sacrifices. So this is not like a one-trick pony. It's not like you do one thing and you get a result. You're constantly doing all things with the right heart, with honor to God, and walking out a relationship. Anybody ever have some off seasons? Anybody? Am I the only one? All right. So we're, we're learning how to do these patterns or what? Divine, accurate, order, and arrangement. Now, here's the problem when things get out of order. It's a James. That whether there is, so let's, let's look at the, if we were reading the NIV or the ESV, I was going to say where there is um, jealousy and self-ambition. But it says where there's, King James is going to say where there's envy and strife where there's jealousy and faction pulling away. So where there's division, it'll say that there is every evil work. What that means is, well, it'll say there's confusion. And the word confusion means disorder. There's confusion in every evil work. So the ESV will tell you there is disorder in every vile practice. So what happens when certain things get into our life, right? Disorder comes. So if we let stuff get in our heart, I know y'all have never been jealous. I know you've never been mad. I know you've never had self-ambition, envy, or any of those other things. But for your pastor who has, I recognize that when I've had, thank you, Demetrius, it's just me and you, bud. The rest of them, Michael and Gabriel. But you and I, we're working our way up to our wings. So, so when you get those things that says there's what? Confusion, disorder. So disorder really started from where, guys? My chaos in the world? In my heart. It really started in my heart, right? Because seeds get planted in my heart. This is the constant battle, and we're gonna deal with this. The constant battle. So when those seeds get planted, then ultimately disorder can come. And here's the problem I always tell you. Disorder comes in, and it says, every evil practice or every evil spirit, depending on which, which translation you're reading. So I don't get to say, I'll take a devil of lust, but I won't have a devil of murder. I'll take a devil of poverty, but I won't have a devil of hatred. You, you don't get to do that. Once the doors open, here's the thing that I learned so much under Archbishop, understanding the legalities of the spirit, how the the access of Satan comes into our life, the basis on which he gets an advantage over us. Now, disorder is one of the main ways, not just because it's disorder. So when the wife is ahead and it's really the husband who's spiritually, there's disorder when the kids are running the house, when, when the money's out of order, 
when your mind is, when your spirit life, anything in your life, disorder, disorder opens up a door. So God does what? What did he start out? The spirit of God came, the, the earth was dark and it was void, right? So it was an empty, kind of like an abyss, an empty wasteland, a dateless past, an empty wasteland. It was empty, it was void, it was dark. And the spirit of God moved. When the spirit of God moves, what's the next? Everybody's like, you get this by faith, just name it and claim it. That's nonsense. I don't care how much you speak something without a move of God's spirit, you're not gonna see something. So, so what we need most is God's spirit, Pastor TC. We need the spirit of God to move. And when the spirit of God moves, then we just begin to form things the way God, God did. So we start seeing out of chaos, order come. Order come. So God always starts in chaos and brings what? Order. He doesn't start in order and bring chaos. Hello? So patterns, somebody say pattern. I hope I get through this. Patterns are order and arrangement. It's a model or design from which copies can be made. So it's not our job to design it, it's our job to implement it. So when an order and arrangement is done by the purpose or the intent of God, it puts us where we are properly positioned. So when there's divine accurate order and arrangement in my home, then I'm properly positioned, right? Or with John, he's properly positioned. Position is the way in which a thing or a person is placed and arranged. It's the accurate arrangement. It's the place where one is or it's the location. So it has an advantageous placement. They're enabled to do when it's positioned. Your position is very important. Acts chapter 17, God chooses your place. He chooses your position. He's, God is a God of geography. He chooses your place. He chooses for every person to be born, there's an intended position for you. So every position of purpose comes with a divine, what, principle and divine policy. So I teach these all the time, right? Patterns, positioning, principles, and policy. I'm gonna give them to you just in case you don't get it. I'm teaching on giving. So position is the origin or the root. It's from the root word deposit. It means to set, to place, to be suitable, to set down as fact. You add the suffix if you've got positive, right? Which means the nature of. Anytime you're in position, then you're ultimately going to see God's positive results. So in other words, all my blessings from God come through my position in Christ. Amen? So it's my position in Christ. Ultimately, God sums everything up in heaven and in earth in Christ. Our position in him. I can do all things through by my position of resting is what that word through means. By my position of resting in him. So it's positionally that I am an heir with God because I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ. So it's all about my positioning. I don't get to bypass Jesus to get to God the Father. I get to go through. I'm in him. That's a great place to be, isn't it, guys? Isn't that a great place to be? Jesus rocks. Somebody should say amen. So when we look at this, we start seeing a positive result. We start seeing the goodness of God. So I believe that people that live with those positive results have some type of principle they live by. So when I begin to understand their patterns, it's a divine, accurate order and arrangement. That's my positioning, how I'm positioned. Ask John what I live by. I, ne I try, I try, I can't say I never have. I try to never judge people. Only God can see the inside, only God knows the heart. So I watch patterns for a while, Ryan, and when I have some kind of inkling, I ask the Lord, so what's my position around them? Who am I, How, what's my place in their life or not in their life? Like I don't judge them, that's not my job to do. That's God's job. Plus, I don't need judgment back on me, Jasmine. So I'm positioning myself at all times. See, some oh, y'all are looking at me crazy. Do you just think, y'all are thinking like, I'm positioning myself at all times. That's, you're like, God's gonna drop you out of the sky and just here you go? No, it's, some things are really common sense with positioning. Don't be the frog that sits on the log and thinks it's jumped off. 
you're still sitting on the log. I mean, there's some things that we got into it last week. Submit to this, submit to this, submit to this. There's some things that are just very clear in God's word, right? Say, bring it on, Pastor Paula. It's all about your good life, guys. Okay, so when they live by principles, what are those? Principles are fundamental truths, our laws upon which others are based on. It's a rule of conduct. So it's a rule of conduct. So principles are a rule of conduct in which policy is formed by. Policy is from the root word police, a department that provides order in any governor principle. The way you govern your life are your rules of conduct. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 18 through 23. Let's go there now. Therefore shall you lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul and bind them for a sign upon your hand that they may be as frontlets between your eyes, verse 19. And you shall teach your children them from children speaking of them. And when thou sittest in the house and when thou walkest by the way, when you liest down, when you rises up, then he goes on and write them on the doorposts of your house that your days may be multiplied. So where do we get our principles from, which are a policy that governs? Word to God. I'm definitely not getting it from Vogue or Cosmopolitan. Not CNN or Fox. I hate to say not even, I love them all, but not even my local Christian television station because they let some crazy stuff on there. I'm getting it from the word of God. Amen. I hide the word of my heart that I might not sin against thee. So if I'm doing that, What's it doing? Keeping me in God's pattern, right? Positioning me properly, right? Living by principles that are the policy of my life. So I don't need the government to hand me something. God's already done it. Amen? I don't, God's already done it. So I have patterns. I'm positioned. I live by principles. And there's policy. This book is full of policy. It's the best constitution you'll ever read. <laughs> It's full of policy. It's governing my life. We got it? Say, we've got it, guys. So we've got 20 more minutes to do this together. All right. So the first principle, let's go into this. So we diligently keep these commandments, right? We diligently keep these commandments of God's word. We keep his principles, his policy. We want to have those positive results. Remember all those positive results I just read to you about when you honor God with first fruits? We want those. I want that angel being tackled before John's up there. <laughs> Y'all aren't listening. All right. For everyone else who wants all the blessings of the Lord, remember that we've got to go back, especially in giving, to the law of first mention. So let's look at Genesis 1.26. We're going to find the first principle, God's original intention or his final decision. His patterns are permanent. Genesis 1.26 through 28. Take dominion, subdue, be fruitful, multiply, replenish, right? Got them? Say it. Take dominion, subdue, be fruitful, multiply, replenish. What's the second principle? It's by way of policy. Genesis 2, verse 16 and 17. The Lord commanded of every tree, eat freely, but of the tree of knowledge and good and evil thou shalt not eat, or you will surely die. So he's given a principle by way of policy. So there's a violation of both the principle and the policy. What do they do, guys? They eat, right? Now, how many of you know what happens next? You're a result of what happens next. <laughs> Dr. Paul, are you the only one? This is not a trick question. When they ate, what happened? Adam and Eve didn't just fall. We all fell. Every human that would ever be born. I know you think you were born the righteous of the Lord. You, thank you. You were born a dirty, downright sinner. Some of y'all, no, I'm just kidding. I was, I was going to be Henri right there and just say you still are, but I'm going to behave right now. So what happens? They ate and they violate the principle and there's consequences, Right? So this violation, how many of you are with me? How many of you believe there are, there's consequences? How many of you think there should have been consequences? Y'all are? I'm glad. You know I'm setting you right up. How many of you believe there should have been consequences? How many of you would have walked in and went, that darn Adam and Eve, man, they deserve to, what, 
die? Now y'all are getting, because I told you I'm setting up. Now you're like, oh, we should have had grace in the garden. (laughs) What makes you different than Adam and Eve? Except a a, a big thing called Christ, but that's a whole other theological discussion, okay? You still still have principles and policies. If you were born before Christ, what makes you different? If you violate the principle, if you don't obey the policy, if you get out of position, and if you ignore the pattern, do you walk in the promises of God? Even though you have Christ Jesus. Nah, you don't. Now, the sad part is I think on the basis of the finished work of Jesus Christ, that's going to get so many people further because none of us deserve anything so much further than, than I believe honestly, if you were drunk right now and I could put a lot of other things on that, every vile, evil thing we put on that and you in the mercy of God cried out, God, forgive me. I received Jesus Christ. I believe God would pay attention and hear you and right in that moment, you would be saved by the grace and the finished work of Jesus Christ. I think your life would be wasted. I really do. I think the beam of seat might be embarrassing. I don't know. That's the reward. I, I don't know. I think that, that, that you had so much more. You're not going to be reincarnated. You're not coming back. You're not coming back as another human being. You didn't live in Paris before. Now you're back here in America. <laughs> this is it, guys. This is it. Because I know some of y'all are like, deja vu. I've been here. <laughs> See, y'all, 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 I'm getting in your stuff tonight, and this is all about offering. You See, only Pastor Paula is going to teach this way on offering. Because we rightfully are all going to agree that when Adam and Eve fell, they find themselves naked and ashamed. Are we all going to agree on that? Okay, so let's find it, the result. Genesis 3, 1 through 6, the serpent comes to the woman. You won't die. Your eyes will be open. The woman sees the tree. It's good. She eats. It's given to her. She gives it to her husband. Verse 7, and the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they started hiding. They started sewing fig leaves together and made themselves aprons, and I've taught so many different ways. We're just left in stitches and how we hide behind the things of man-made garments to cover our nakedness. The feeling of being uncovered is the feeling of being out of position. They were out of position. You see, when something's often here, I can't go 24 hours because I know something's not Right. Something's not in position. Now, I wish it were so easy that God would just send an angel down and say, Paula, this is what needs to happen. This is what I want you to do. And this is how you get it right. Sometimes I say, John, I don't know what to do. I just know that I need to, I need to shut it out here from God. I'm going to do the things I know to do. I know to pray. I know to fast. I know to give. I know to forgive. I know to get anything out of my heart. I know to repent. I know the blood of Jesus redeems me. And sometimes that 30 minutes of prayer or three minutes of prayer or 30 seconds, shh, I'm right back. And sometimes I'm not. So sometimes I got to get the magnifying glass out. I have to inspect my life, inspect myself. I have to sit there and and really look, inspect every aspect of my life. Because if I know better and I don't do it, it becomes sin to me. Now, I might have friends, call them friends, whatever, acquaintances that do it, and it's not sin to them. Samson could not have got a haircut. Ryan, you're fine with a haircut. But Samson could not have a haircut. Greg, you're okay. Todd, let's see what's going on over there. All right. (laughs) But Samson, no bueno. Keep your hair, dude, because for you, it's going to bring destruction. You see, there are some things that we all just know. 
But there are other things that God begins to bring us into places. Now, if Todd says the Lord spoke to him about doing something with giving that is beyond his tithe and et cetera, that shoe might not fit over, just let me pick someone, to BJ right now. But maybe it does. Maybe it's an encouragement of faith. But maybe to him it will become sin because God has given him a specific rhema instruction. Told him to do something specific. Where for you, you're bringing your tithe or maybe giving a little more in offering, but God didn't tell you that specific. And it's not going to be spelled out in here. It's going to tell you to give. Amen? But not everything's going to be the same instruction. Okay. I'm using easy things, guys. I'm using easy things right now. Because you, you can't put yourself in with the masses and compare your life. And we're going to get that because part of Cain and Abel is comparison and competitiveness. I'm going to give you the five things that took them down and how it was all over an offering. So bring it on. What happens, he gets out of position. Genesis 3, 8 and 9, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. God called Adam, where are thou? Now you think God was really just saying, it's an all-inclusive word. I'll, I'll get to the point. What he was saying is, who are you? Why are you? Where are you? What are you? And when it says he called him, it means he arrested him. You can find out today it's the same as in Psalm 4. He called him. He accosted him is what it means. First fruits is the order or one of the orders, let's say, the order or a pattern of God. All first, first hours, first day, keep it holy, firstborn, first of increase, first of our brethren, all first belong to, we agree on that? Now, there's just fun things. I was telling Pastor Todd, um, in Psalm 42, David said, Oh, my soul, why are thou cast down? Why are you disquieted? Means despondent. And he says, hope not thou in God. The word hope means stay, trust, wait, be patient. That's what he's saying. For I shall yet, I will again, I will repeatedly, I will still, I will more praise him. He says, therefore, I will remember. It's really interesting. I will remember. And that word remember is zakar. It's first fruits. It means to mark the male. I will honor God with the divine accurate order and arrangement, the pattern of God in my life. Man, that was heavy. And then he goes, deep call it deep. I won't even get into all of that with you because what he's saying is an abyss of a surging of a mass of water, a place that is depth will make an uproar. What's in me is deeper than what's on the outside. Call it through the idea of accosting. I'm calling you into position is what God is saying. And David's talking to his soul, saying my spirit, the depth in me is calling me into position to honor God first to praise God while I'm sitting here and waiting for my breakthrough while my enemies are devouring things yet will I praise him because he tells us to he tells us all and so so there's so much depth to this that's why as a Christian we really do know how to conduct our life but we still sit on the law because deciding is not doing so say bring it on so God says to him, where are you? Where are you in relation to the position I left you? Matthew chapter 18, 11, I'm gonna keep doing it. Son of man came to do what? To save that which was lost, to rescue that which was out of position. When you get saved, you're getting put in position. You're getting rescued. You're being made whole. You're being put in position. Now, some of us had a pretty wild change the day off, but it probably took years and is still taking years and decades to keep taking us from glory to glory. Some people didn't feel anything, but you were changed. You got put in position. Amen. So now after we're in position, right, what happens? We start walking in divine principles. Our life's been governed by his policy. First things first. You ready? Say, bring it on. So let's look at the very first one, first mention of first fruits. Let's go to Genesis chapter four, Genesis chapter four. Hebrews chapter 11, verse four says, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice, literally a much more full or complete sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man. Somebody say righteous. In 20 minutes, can I tell you the difference between two brothers? 
Now know this, that offerings were already established. There was a form of worship. We don't see it in Genesis 1, or we don't see and know everything, but they, they knew they were making offerings, all right? So this was not like the very first offering. They had, there was a form of worship. Pastor Brad's taught you that. Genesis chapter 4, verse 3 through 11. In the process of time, somebody say in the process of time. It came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Abel brought also the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. Say firstling and fat. Look at somebody say, you look fat. Say, give God the fat. It's important. And the Lord had respect unto Abel. Now, we, we always say all people are equal. We use a one scripture. We use an Acts scripture. We use a Hebrew scripture. God is the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. And God is no respecter of persons with Peter, right? That's not true. That is not true. I'm telling you right now on the basis of the word that God sits and looks at some people's offering. He goes, I respect that. I don't respect that. That's acceptable. That's not acceptable. Amen. Ooh, it is quiet in this Presbyterian church. Dr. Paul, do you want to come finish this for me? Because everyone just went, whoa. <laughs> But to Canaan's offering, he had not respect. And Cain was mad about it. That's a bad move. Just by the, the, let me just talk to you guys. If God's upset with you, don't get mad at the man that created everything. That's just not, it's just probably not gonna turn out good for you, I'm, I'm telling you. And so Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. Now here's grace. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you wroth? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do us well, underlie in it. Because you think it means if you do us well, we're going to find out what it means. Shall, shall you not be accepted? Man. And if you do not well, sin lies at the door. Unto thee shall be his desire and thou shall rule over him. Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And we don't know how long this was. Was it a day? Was it months? Was it years? Cain talked with Abel. Came to pass when they were in the field. Cain rose up against Abel's brother and he killed him. He slew him. And the Lord said to Cain, where's your brother Abel? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood crieth out from the ground. And now you are cursed from the earth which had opened your mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. And he goes on in Hebrews, it says that the death of Abel, his blood speaks forever. So what else does this mean? Let's read it. Verse seven, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? Accepted first off means an elevation. It means exaltation in rank or character. It, it means to be advanced, to be raised up. So he goes, if you do what's right, I'll lift you up. I'll bring you up out of this. Boy, that is grace right now. I don't care if you've done this thing a, a wrong a thousand times. God is saying right now, and I'll get to, I'll get to if thou doest well or if thou doest what is right, what it actually means. He says, I'll elevate you. Aren't you glad that we serve a God that pulls us up out of pits, out of generational curses, out of ourself, out of the sickness of our own soul? out of our laziness, out of our ignorance, out of whatever excuse would hold us back, that God is good, Kaya. That's what I mean. I'm so used to excessive goodness of God. I don't want to live with that uh, in here. I want to live with that fire. I want to live with that power. I want to live with that energy. I want to live with that fellowship and that flow in my life. So if thou doest well, I'll, I'll, I'll bring you up. Cain brought this offering. What did Cain do, guys? He brought an offering of fine flour oil and frankincense. It wasn't like he didn't bring God something. It's called a gratitude offering. He brought God a gratitude offering. Abel, it says, also brought of the first links. So what did Abel bring? He, he brought a gratitude offering, but he also brought a first fruit. So he not only gave a gratitude offering, but he brought the firstborn of the flock. That's a first fruit. So did Cain give, guys? Did Cain give? Yeah, isn't it trick? Yes, King gave a gratitude, but not enough. Not enough. He gave only in part. According to the Bible, he didn't give in faith. 
and it, it references this whole thing that I'm getting ready to take you to in the New Testament. Because the New Testament tells us, don't be like Cain. You've got a whole chapter that I'm getting, it's telling you not to be like Cain. So if this wasn't relevant for us, it wouldn't be brought up in Jude. It wouldn't be brought up in Hebrews. It wouldn't be brought up in so many books of the Bible. Pastor Ryan, it would have been left right there as a nice little uh, wonderful Bible story that I could take and make applicable. But we go all the way in the New Testament and he's gonna specifically take me back to this and tell me don't be like it. On one hand, Abel brought the first fruit and the fat, and God had respect. This is really about obedience. It's a heart issue. It's an honor issue. It's an obedience issue. 1 Samuel 15, 22, today, to obey is better than to sacrifice. Now watch this. Genesis 4, 3, in the process of time, the Hebrew literally means at the end of the days. So it means one thing at this particular time had ended, and now there is a first, there's a beginning. So in that period of an ending and a new beginning is the period of first fruits. Because anytime there's an increase, anytime there's an ending and a beginning, it's a time of honoring God with the first. It continues to say, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soul as an offering to the Lord. So he brought an offering, but it was brought in part. Partial obedience is disobedience, right? So we know that worship is our response to what we value the most. So his mercy and grace says to Cain, if thou doest well, what does that mean? To do well means to retrace your steps, to consider your ways. It's a word of repentance, but let's get it down right. To find where was wrong, to find it. Sometimes God says to trek with them. You know what to trek means? It's good, Kalia. You gotta, you've got to get like a detective out. You track, can you track with God? Can you, can you walk on the same path, God? Because God has pathways. So he's saying, I want you to investigate. If your life always has disorder, if there's not that, you know a difference of feeling of, I pray you know a difference of walking in flow and walking in, there's a difference in everything. So when you're walking in the spirit, there's a rhythm to that. There's a flow to that. It doesn't mean you're exempt from life's problems. It means that there's no, there's no shut off to the hopes. It's the power of God flowing through you. So to do well means to retrace your steps, to consider your ways, to find where you were wrong and to mend his offering and his attention accordingly. It's crazy in the, the church that we've built as the modern day church. We want the pastor, the priest, or someone, the elder, to come just lay hands on us, throw some oil on us to make our wrong go away. But God says, we've got to investigate and find where it's wrong. How many of you know the more you grow in God, sometimes that's a bigger search? You know, when you're little, like you're, like you're a baby Christian, he's like, here's, here's where it was, doll. Now it's like, really, I mean, okay, God, you just know. You gotta investigate, see. Cain's error was not simply in his offering, was it? Was it just about an offering, guys? Was it about an offering? If it was, I wouldn't be teaching this. It wasn't about his offering. It's about his attitude. It's about his heart. That's it. It's his heart. So Matthew 6, 21 says, where your treasure is, where your deposit, your wealth is, there will your heart be also. When Cain violated this principle, there's four things he lost. I don't want any of us to ever lose these things. And I'm gonna tell you the way of Cain and the way of Abel in 12 minutes. He lost the presence of God. He was expelled from the presence of God. That's gotta be the greatest loss in the world. I, I can't even imagine. And Cain says, this is too much on me. This is way too much. Right there, I mean, seriously, like, I, I can't even imagine. Elder, I, I, I ponder sometimes in my deepest, darkest days and despondent, no matter what I face, I've never faced it without God since I was 18 years old. And so Dr. Paul, it's so, so foreign to me that it scares me to think of that because God is my best friend. He's my greatest love. He, he's everything to me. He, he is... When, when you start describing he's my rock, he's my lily in the valley, he's my rose of Sharon, he's my El Shaddai, he's my Jehovah Nisi, he's my Jehovah Jireh, I say, we haven't even started on the first letter. That's not even the first date. 
Like, I'm like, I, it just, he's everything. He's the fiber of my being. He's my heartbeat. He's my breath. He's life to me. I couldn't imagine being separated from God. Like how cruel it is that we don't teach the truth of the gospel, that there is a place called heaven and a place called hell. That there are consequences to our decisions. Real love is not telling people what they want to hear always. It's telling people the truth of what they need to hear. And you can do that in love. You don't have to be a judgmental snob Christian. You can do that in extreme love. Get down on the well with the known adulterer and sit with her. Sit, high rabbi, son of God, with the known adulterer and converse with her. Be authentic, be intentional, be empathetic, be understanding. He lost the presence of God. The second thing he lost was his connection with his family. His relationships went sour without the prayer. This is all, technically, this is all over an offering. But the offering is never about the offering. The offering is about the heart. The offering is about to whom much is given, much is required. The offering is that you don't get to stay on milk all the days of your life. You, get to, you have to go to meat. So now this is so much more than just an offering. It's a heart. He loses the presence of God. He loses connection with his family. His relationships will go sour without the presence and the protection of God. He'll lose his security in his fixed position. He had to flee from his place. He had no secure residence, no covering, no safety for his life. And he loses his harvest. He loses his income. He loses his, his ability to produce. The ground was cursed. It would not yield any adequate recompense from his tillage. Because when you violate God's principles, you lose the blessings of your harvest. On the other hand, when you abide in them, when you obey them with a right heart, not just out of dutifulness like the Sadducees and Pharisees, but they're great rewards. Hebrews 11, 4 says, Abel was counted as righteousness. Now, this is one of the most important things I'm gonna teach you right now. It just seems like we think right now, like he's just counted as righteousness, right? Like he's in right standing. That's the simplified way. Break down every single word into the Greek and go break it down again. It literally comes out like this. That when it says he was counted as righteousness before God, it means he made a decision by principle with execution. So it literally reads like this. Abel made a decision by principle with execution. Five frogs are sitting on a log. Four decide to jump off. How many are still on the log? Forty people sit in a church. They hear the word of God. How many of them decide to go back and investigate and look at their heart and change their life? Doesn't matter if you decide how many do go back and investigate and change their life. Because if not, 40 people are gonna sit here next Wednesday and 40 the next and 40 and 40 and we're gonna be the same situation. But I break that in the name of Jesus. It's gonna be 400, then 800. Come on, it's going to be because we're going to do, not just decide. He made a decision by principle with execution. You can determine your future in a large degree by your decisions. To decide means to cut, what you're willing to cut. By aligning yourself with the word of God, Numbers 18, 13, whatsoever is first ripe in the land, which shall bring unto the Lord the first thing of a cow or the first thing of a sheep or the first thing of a goat. Why? All first belong to God because first are devoted things, first are irrevocable giving over to the Lord. Jeremiah 2 verse 3, Israel was a first fruit to the Lord. Leviticus chapter 27, no one who ever dedicates a firstborn, whether of an animal, whether of a land, whether of a person, a household, no person can take that, whether it's an ox or sheep, because it is the most devoted unto the Lord. It's first fruits, right? Exodus chapter 13, we can go through every single one of these. Romans chapter 11, verse 16, if the first roots be holy, then the root is holy. If the root's holy, then the branches are holy. 
So whatever the first is used for governs what happens to the rest. Amen? We're children of God because Jesus was the first fruit, 2 Corinthians, of many brethren. So the first determines the destiny of everything else. So what I want to give you in five minutes, won't happen, but what I wanna give you in five minutes, because this means that whatever the first portion is used for determines what happens to the rest, that I'd say, beware of the Cain spirit. Let me say it in a little bit easier way. Beware of the spirit that possessed Cain to move him out of position. We have no idea how long it was till he killed Abel. Maybe Dr. Paul and Pastor Todd know, but I've studied it for a long time. There's no, it was a hundred years, is five years. Brian, maybe you know, but I have no idea. There's not a theologian I found yet that can say this was the exact time in between. He was out of position. Instead of quickly getting back in position, he stayed out of position. It is painful. So what's the way of Cain? Because it tells us in 1 John chapter 1, verse 11 through 13. You ready? For this is the message that you heard from the beginning. So if it wasn't important to us, why is he telling this in 1 John? This is the message you heard from the beginning that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil. We're talking over an offering, guys. We're talking about a first fruit offering. Doesn't it sound like, think about what I'm teaching. Doesn't this sound harsh for not bringing an animal to the altar? <laughs> Dr. Paul, it seems harsh to me. But somehow this dude knew what to do and didn't do it. This is not God going, hmm, I'm going to be moody today. I didn't like what you gave me, but I liked what you gave me. God has an order. God has principles. God has patterns. God has policy. And when we know those things and fail to apply those things to our life, we take on the spirit of Cain. He says, love one another. Well, you just don't know who. <laughs> there are people leaving church all the time. There's nothing wrong with that church, most likely. You're gonna get hurt at another church just like you got hurt in the club. Just like you got hurt somewhere else. People leaving marriages all the time. I am not an expert to talk on this. I think I got it right. <laughs> I promise you, bring so much hurt brings so much damage. There's, what he's saying is, look, my word, my principles, my policy have to govern your life. Y'all don't like this. I'll just get you back to the reward. Angels coming, psych. Enemy to your enemy, psych. Not when you're doing your own thing, when we're doing God's thing, right, Darren? Let's read the message here. For this is the original message we heard. We should love each other. We cannot be like Cain, who joined the evil one and then killed his brother. And why did he kill him? Because he was deep in the practice of evil, while the acts of his brother were righteous. So don't be surprised, friends, when the world hates you. This has been going on a long time. Jude 11. So we're in John about it. Now we're over in Jude. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. Don't even get me into what all this is because we'd be a long time. Taking ministry and using it for money. Prophet lying. There's a whole lot of other stuff that I'd put in there. The way of Cain's gonna do five things and I'll teach it to you later. You ready? Number one, it starts with the corrupt heart. Jeremiah 17, nine through 10, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked, who can know it? I, the Lord, search for the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing. It says it's deceitful. It means it's fraudulent. So he says our heart is fraudulent. You cannot trust it. Fraudulent means to trick you. It's an act of misrepresenting. You better double check your heart. I got to double check it. Because just when I think I am the sweetest girl on earth, man, I can bite somebody's head off. My heart is fraudulent. I've got to work on it every day. My job is make sure I'm right for Jesus and help everyone along the way. It is not to fix you, it's to fix me. Amen? Amen. Proverbs 4.23, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it flow the issues, the boundaries. 
So my boundaries are established out of what's in my heart. First John 3, 18 through 22, my little children, let us not love in word or deed, but and in truth, hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. If our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence towards God. And whatever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his, come on, commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Condemn means to note against us or find fault, to bring judgment against. So Cain's offering, what was the big problem? Cain's offering was done out of obligation, not out of love. Cain's offering was done under his own terms, not out of God's terms. So Cain is pride. He's full of pride and he's arrogant. He did what he wanted to do and he gave what he wanted to give. The minute we wake up any day and do what we wanna do, go where we wanna go and give what we wanna give, we're walking in the way of Cain. We're walking in the way of Cain. And the problem of it is so deceitful. We all think we're great Christians. But guys, this is a, this is a serious race. The, the church is in bad shape in many ways. God will always have a remnant. He'll always have a remnant. But the church is, I mean, heroes, people I've, I've looked up to and respected. I'm seeing some crazy stuff come out of some people's mouth. Some things that can be really confusing to our next generation's culture's changing all the time, right? And it seems like it's infected the church. You know, I, maybe I just grew up in old school. I'll be, I'll be through, I'll give you these five points and we're gonna come to the altar here. Maybe I just grew up in old school, but you didn't go to the altar and get saved and all of a sudden get baptized with the Holy Spirit and three days later you were apostle so-and-so with your two bodyguards around you. It, it, it's, it's, it's off. It's crazy. We're, we're fighting over our kids under 18 years old with gender. <laughs> what do I call it now? I'm not gonna even give, give the devil enough credit on that. Let me call it what it is with gender mutilation. <laughs> because they put nice terms, gender affirming. Gender affirming. I've got to call you a pronoun as you identify yourself with, as a dog, a she dog. No, it's mental. It's crazy. I'm not saying everybody's, it's a demon. Y'all are gonna get mad at me right now, but I'm telling you, Jesus, look, suicidal hurting and I'm compassionate. My gosh, my father killed himself. I have struggled with deep depression. I've struggled with bondage. I have struggled with a lot of different things. I've struggled with sin and I've needed deliverance. I've needed deliverance. We need God to move. We need God to move. We're not gonna counsel all this back into order. God has a divine order that he created from the very beginning. And we're mutilating that order in every area, every which way. Materialism, we, we've done it with, with, with education. When you look at Yale and Harvard, they were places that produced God men. They were places that produced our elite theologians. I don't know what they're producing now, Dr. Paul. It's pretty crazy. I can keep going, but I don't need to because you live in the same world that I live in. It's crazy. It's upside down. It's upside down. I don't care how much you try to say wrong is right. Wrong is wrong. Right is right. And I'm not picking on any one thing. I'm saying that we've got to go back and say, no, baby, you don't get to be called apostle. I'm ripping the title off you. You might have to go. You might find some place you can get an online uh, license and go perform your $100 weddings. You, you, you do that. But as long as I'm here, I'm going to tell you you're wrong. You're wrong. You need to sit your behind down. You need to learn what it is to be a servant. You need to know what it is to pour water on someone's feet. You too, you're too proud to do foot washing where well, you aren't like Jesus because he said, you, you, I can have no part with you if you don't let me wash your feet. 
And we, we, we've got to learn how to pray our way through till Christ be formed in you. Until I preach you a bunch of no, n- nonsense, I've got to learn how to pray to see if Christ actually got formed inside of you. Before I ever go public, there's a whole lot of private stuff that's got to take place. The way of Cain is he wanted it his way. And that's not how God does. God's always testing us, always pruning us, always doing things. Number two, and I'm not going to teach you. I'll come back. It was a competitive spirit. Number three, he was a conniver. Number four, he was cursed. And the result of bringing superficial sacrifice came from a corrupt heart, a rest in a, a competitive spirit. He played out a conniving lifestyle. He winds up with the curse, and now he will always be a wanderer and never a settler. Because Genesis chapter 4, verse 11, 12 says, Now there are curse from the earth, which has opened up your mouth to receive my brother's blood from my hand, which till is the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond thou shall be. So here's the end result. Fugitive means to waver, to go up and down. Vagabond means always disappearing to taunt. Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, dwelt in the land of Nod to be in exile or to remain in wandering. It's up, down, up, down, in, out. Can't stay planted in a church. Can't stay planted in Christ. Can't stay planted in anything. I, here's how I do the Bible. I look at the end result, then I back up the process. I ask myself, is there any vagabond spirit working in my life? Is there any fugitive spirit working in my life? So for me, Let me tell you what happens. I was abandoned as a child, as if y'all don't know my story. I'm done in one minute. I had abandonment issues. So when I felt threatened, I was a runner. I was a runner, because that's what abandoned people do. And the problem is abandonment, guys, is not a psychological thing. It's a demon thing. (laughs) Because the family starts getting breaking up. We've got children that have been abandoned. We've got people that have been abused. It's going to leave marks on your life, etc. So what happens to somebody that's been abandoned? They run. You think I had a vagabond spirit? Oh, yeah, I did. Because I'm going to do what Job did. The thing which I feared the most has come upon me. So when I'm trying to pull you cro- close, I'm going to push you out before you have the ability to hurt me. Not anymore, because that fugitive spirit and that wandering spirit doesn't get to operate in my life. Why are you looking at me like I'm the only person with any issues? So come on, guys. You look at the end result, Romans 1, 23. You look at the 23 things. You look at what happens to Cain. Four things, loses the presence, loses his family relationships, loses his property, Some people, your generations have never been able to get property. Why? Break it. There's certain things that Cain teaches us. And he says, don't go the way of Cain. There's five things that cause these results in Cain's life. Ryan, the way I study the Bible, I go, number one, he lost this. Number two, he lost that. Number three, he lost that. Number four. Okay, what happened? Those four things he lost. Have you ever lost that, Paula? Yep. Did you ever have that? Yep. Why? Oh, it's a fugitive spirit. It's a vagabond spirit. Okay, this is here. How did I deal with it? There were five things. Let me back up. Get those five things right. Let me get the heart right. The giving is actually easy. That's not the hard part. The offering's not the hard part. It's this whole process that most of us don't want to go through because all of us are sick. The great physician didn't come from those who are healed and well. This is not, this is not a museum here. This is a hospital here. They're hurting people. They're broken people. Even sitting, listening week after week after week. And if it's not for you, it's for you to learn to teach somebody else. If you'd say, Pastor Paul, I got something out of the word. Stand up. Let's pray. If you take it to the next step and you'd say, I didn't just get something out of the word, it pierced me in a place. Part of this process needs to be worked on in my life. Lift up your hand. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Every single one of you. You know what I'm going to do? Bring you to the altar. Because I don't want to lay hands on you all the time, but I do want you to bring to the altar why you're taking a step of faith. Just take a step of faith. One step that says, God, change me. One step that says, God, I need you. One step that says, God, investigate me. One step. See, Abel will teach us the way too. Abel will teach us the way. I always tell you guys this, Eli, it's not that I'm any different than you. It's just I have the advantage of studying and repenting. 
I just have a few hours advantage here of studying and repenting, okay? And that step is a step of repentance. That step is a step of crying out to God saying, help me, I need you. That step is a step that says, God, I really do in my heart want 10 generations. I want my grandkids to have property. I want them to have family relationships. I don't want it to be line after line of divorce. I don't want any more shotgun weddings. I don't want any more, I don't want anything. I broke a lot of that, Brad's breaking more. But God, I won't, I don't want Asher to go through it. I don't want that next to go through it. I don't want that great, great grandchildren to go through it. And I just believe God, I believe in my childlike faith. I believe this because I understand there's a spirit realm. I, I'm doing this, look, it might be God speaks to you. Someone needs to hear this. I would get set back every six weeks I would feel like I was advancing and about every six weeks, I'd feel like I like moved forward 20 feet, got knocked back 40. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And I just kept feeling setback after setback. I went on a 21 day fast, thinking the fast would break it. That was my intention. My intention was I'm gonna fast to break this. Some go not out. Nothing broke after 21 days because in my limited thinking at the time, I thought fasting broke wicked spirits, Pastor C. I didn't know that wicked spirits, all, excuse me, that fasting also brought revelation. I wasn't that advanced at the time in the word of God. I just knew it brought some go not out, but by fasting and prayer. God didn't break it by fasting. God downloaded revelation. Remember one of the things I said to you is fasting brings revelation. It brings sight. It's all in my book. So Tiffany, I didn't get set free by the fast. I got revelation. And the revelation, God told me to give $1,000. Now, Kaya, you're like, yeah. I can't say I was like, yeah. I was kind of like, <laughs> how? Because I, 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 I knew I heard from God. Yeah. I went and pulled Tupperware and stuff out of that kitchen, had a yard sale. I borrowed money from people. I don't even know how I got it all together. But I took $1,000 to Bayshore United Methodist Church in South Tampa, Florida, a tiny little church. I laid it on an altar. Nobody knew what was in it. It was just a, I think it's a youth service. Pastor Side, I just put it down in complete obedience. Xavier, I didn't get up. There was no fireworks, thunder going off. I can't tell you when it changed but I never had that setback again. That feeling of being an abandoned five-year-old little girl that plagued me as an adult woman, it was gone. It wasn't like I felt something lift me, like when I got delivered from an eating disorder. It's just Asia, it was done. It wasn't a one-step thing. It wasn't a, it was a, it's a multi many things that God was working out. Now deliverance has not always been that fast for me. I'm going through something right now. I need God to give me a divine deliverance. I've done everything I know to do. So I'll keep doing something till God gives me that instruction of what will break this. I need it broken because I don't like the devil having an upper hand in any area. So we're all on this boat together. Do I have money? I have enough money. You don't have to buy me groceries or anything. John and I are good, we're good, don't worry. We aren't going away getting divorced or anything crazy. Am I sick? No. But I have a demon that keeps wanting to threaten something that I'm caring for God. And I need a divine deliverance. And my God is faithful. Amen. Now you might be believing God for a house, I'm believing him for a city. I'm believing him for things that are not even born yet. One of us isn't better or less. We're just in different places of our assignment. I need the same faith that you need. You need the same faith that I need. I need the same grace you need. I'm gonna have to work with the same tools you're working with because all the people I know, Humpty Dumpty and all his men and all the king's horses and all the king's men can't put this one back together again. And I know some Pretty important people. They can't fix it. I need a divine deliverance. You need a divine deliverance? 
Come on, talk to me. See, that's what God was saying to Cain. It doesn't have to turn out this way for you. Just go back, make this right. Abel, bring this forth. Now, there's a lot. We'll come teach it all. I'll teach you what it does. Is the blood crying out? I'll teach you all of that before we're done. But in the name of Jesus right now, God, as we took our first step, we say we retrace. If there's things that you bring to us, let them be downloaded and deposited. Let our heart be right. Let us not have a passive aggressive spirit or conniving one or manipulative one. Let us not put our hand to it and try to make things happen. Let it be your hand that we are led by, oh God. I pray right now that you do, not by might and not by power, but only by your spirit what you can do. In the name of Jesus, Jesus, that any corruption of our heart, any competitiveness in our spirit, any conniving in our lifestyle, anything that looks or any curse, if it's been a word curse, words that we've spoken over ourselves, words that have been spoken over us, we break them in the name of Jesus. We put it under the blood, any access we've given the enemy. We, we shut that door by the superior blood of Jesus Christ right now. And we declare that the days of vagabond and fugitive are over. They're over. I declare that everyone here here will not wander. They won't be up and down spiritually, but they'll be planted. I declare that you'll have property. You'll have good relationships. That your relationships, you won't just go through people. They, 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 they won't be dispensable. In the name of Jesus, I pray covenant relationships to you. I pray any anxiety, any worry, any fear off of your life. Any anger, any hurt, any confusion, let it be broken right now. Any marital conflict, let it stop. Let it cease right now. I pray that you turn the heart the husband toward the heart of the wife the heart of the wife toward the heart of the husband and God we submit our minds to you right now we submit our bodies in Romans chapter 12 I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that we present our bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable and pleasing unto God and be not conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of our mind that we may prove what is the acceptable and perfect and and, and uh, a will of God in the name of Jesus so so even now, God, we thank you that we're being transformed by the washing of the word that transforms our soul. Whatever areas need a divine deliverance, let it be so. We trace, we investigate our life. We trace our ways. We course correct. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for laying out your word to show us. Do not be invoked by the evil one. Do not continue to give in to the evil one. Don't go the way of Cain. Don't go the way of Cain. Don't have a form of God but deny the power of. Don't do your thing, but do God's thing. In the name of Jesus, we submit ourselves in full uh, 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 obedience, God, to your will. We plan ourselves, and we thank you, God. Many people, God, when you know to do better, we have to do better. So we make a decision, and we execute those decisions. We make decisions based on principle, and we execute them. Not because we always feel it, but we just will it. We determine our tomorrow in large part by executing righteous decisions. Let it be done. Pray over the person next to you and we'll dismiss, guys. Thank you for allowing me to go a little bit longer. Just pray over the person. We thank you guys so much for watching online. Love you. Sorry that I went a little bit late, but uh, not sorry because I feel the Holy Spirit working here. Let God just move mightily and you know that God loves you and he really does have a good life for you. Why the Lord is doing a, a serious cutting in my life right now of course correcting things and just examining makes me think that there's great revival ahead, that there's a great outpouring because whenever there's a purging, whenever there's a pruning, it means there's much fruit that we're getting ready to bear. And I believe we're going into that third trimester, so to speak, that when we bear fruit, the fruit will remain. I believe the days and the seasons of loss and lack, and I'm not talking materialism, I'm talking the fruit of God. That, that things that will last eternal in your life, that those are being planted in your heart right now, planted in your life. You will not miscarry anymore. You will, you will not have things that are, are, are forfeited in your life. In the name of Jesus, I pronounce the blessing of the Lord over you, over your generations, over your children and children's children. I speak the Barak. I speak God's word over you. You will be the head and not the tail. You'll be blessed coming in and blessed going out. Your children will be blessed. Your barns will be blessed. 
And I decree it and I declare it according to Job 22, 28. It'll be established in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll turn around and hug that person and say, I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. Just love on them. Amen. I love you guys. Throw up your hands. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now unto him that's able to do exceeding abundantly above all we can ever ask or think according to his power that worketh in us. Thank you for being here. I'll see you on Sunday with Pastor Brad and see you again next Wednesday. I love you guys. Be blessed. See you tomorrow for a jockey party. For a jockey party, all right? Be blessed.